Hey guys, welcome to the Venn Pod. I'm Alex for those who are tuning in for the first time. And next to me is... Hey guys, it's Hannah. So today we're going to be talking about juries. It's a stressful time of year. And we're going to give you some tips and advice that have helped us. And hopefully it will help you guys. We have a ton of points we want to make. Well, Hannah actually is the organized one for this topic. She made a whole Google Doc. And I'm excited because when I read through it, it was really good. So Hannah will kick it off. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, you're so nice to me. And I feel like the reason I felt so strongly about this topic is because I got to do a jury this semester and nobody likes doing juries. Like, honestly, they're like, I get it. I get why we have to do it. It's to hold ourselves accountable. It's to measure our growth. But like nobody, I feel like I personally don't know anybody who is like, yes, I get to play my jury. Like, even if you're feeling confident, everybody's just kind of like, have to play my jury it's just kind of the worst and so I feel like I feel like when we approach jury season um there's like two like main vibes going around the first vibe is like you know that you're ready for it but you're like super nervous about it and I feel like I'm in that boat right now like I know that I have done the work leading up to this point to like be ready but I'm still like kind of nervous and not really jazzed about it and then I feel like there are people who are like oh shoot, I forgot about juries or oh shoot, I haven't done the work. And so then there's like that level of not being ready and also being nervous because you know that you maybe haven't prepared as well as you could have. So we're just going to, um, you know, give you guys some tips on how you can um, prepare for your jury, no matter what, you know, side of that spectrum you're falling on. And hopefully there's something in here for you, even if you're one of those weird, awesome people who's super excited for your jury. If that's you, we just want to give you a round of applause because you're a good person, but couldn't be us. So um, first of all, I feel like we need to just we need to just take a step back from the situation. Nerves are really good at clouding our judgment and uh, clouding our ability to reason. And so when you just take a bit, step back and I would encourage everybody to try and identify the problem. So like, why am I feeling? feeling nervous. So perhaps you're feeling nervous, kind of like I said earlier, because you're not quite ready for your jury. And so I think that it's important for you, if you know that you're not quite as prepared as you should be, to ask yourself why. First of all, why haven't you come to grips with your music? Have you just been so busy that you haven't had the time to prepare? Um, is there like rhythmic stuff, technical passages getting in your way? Are you just like really struggling with your sound or dynamics? Or is collaboration with your pianist not going well? Like, is that why you're not ready whatever the reason is for you I think it's important to identify that because that informs how you're going to proceed how you're going to make yourself ready in the coming days um you know other other reasons you could be nervous um is because juries are a big part of our grade you know I feel like there's a lot of pressure on us as juries approach because we work and work and work all semester and we're in the practice group rooms grinding and we know that we're doing the work but I think there's always that fear in everybody's in everybody's mind like what if my jury performance isn't reflective of all of the work that I know that I have done all this time. And that's a completely valid fear. Um, maybe you're feeling like nervous because you want to do well for yourself and your teacher. I know um, fellow people pleasers enter the room like, hello, I'm here too. I, I really, I really value, you know, approval and affirmation from my mentors. And so there's that a little bit of pressure, like, I want to do well for them. I want to make them proud. Um, maybe you're feeling nervous because you're really good in the practice room. Like you can tear it up when nobody else is around. But the second you get in front of other people, you just kind of freeze. So I think it's important that we take all of these things into consideration because whatever your answer is to why am I feeling nervous is going to inform how you proceed. So Alex and you, lesson everybody, Alex does not have to do a jury. Way to go, Alex. Alex actually had a kick butt recital a couple weeks ago, and then she like has played her pieces on some other people's recitals in the past few weeks. So she's been stressed in other ways. So I mean, she is not she's like, no, thank you. I am exiting the jury room. But um, Alex, can you identify with any of these like in the weeks leading up to your recital? Were you feeling any of these feelings? Were these any concerns on your mind? I mean, definitely. I think one thing for me that I've learned to turn off, thankfully, is the idea of pleasing others. Like, although I want to like please my professors, obviously, I've really tried, especially leading up to either a jury or a recital, 
I've really tried to like tell myself or convince myself because that's the case too that I'm doing this for me I've worked hard I'm here to just show to showcase my talent like I'm not here to get like I don't know people aren't here with malicious intent intent is what I try to tell myself at least because sometimes especially with a recital you sometimes feel like your whole studio is just clarinetist obviously and you're like what if they think I suck? <laughs> and then you're like, ah, am I doing this for them? Am I trying to impress them? Or am I trying to just showcase what I can do? Like, this is for me. Like, I know I have the confidence to do this and this, that, and the third. But when it comes to juries, it's very interesting because I don't know how it is at UNT, but similar to Messiah, we don't have just an all clarinet panel. In fact, we have several woodwind faculty on ours. So that's where it gets tricky because it's like, well, am I, well, do I need to impress them? Because the answer usually is yes, like they're grading you. But like, how do I convince myself that I don't need to impress them? Because by thinking that I freak myself out and knowing that for us, at least we have like an inside joke, that's low key reality. I don't know if you can relate, but some of our professors love contemporary rep. Some of them hate it. So when you pick a piece for jury, and I mean, we might talk about this later because it's one of the points, picking a piece, it's like, do you take that into consideration? Like, are you going in there knowing that someone might tear your piece to shreds, you know? So I don't know. It's hard because you really need to convince yourself, in my opinion, that this is all for you. But ultimately, it is for them, especially in terms of a jury, right? Recitals, it's a little different. You can convince yourself a little bit more. But juries, <laughs> is, and it's scary because you have something listed, which I really like. But it's like, this is just a snapshot of like what you could do. And what's so sad, in my opinion, about juries, about auditions, about recitals, is that it's a one shot thing, like you only have one shot at it. And yes, sometimes we're in a practice room and things go really well. And other times they go really bad. And you're just like, well, what's going to happen when I'm on that stage? So let's keep talking, because I think there's ways we could help prepare for those moments, right? Where, yeah, you are most likely trying to impress your professors, but how do I combat the nerves, right? So you want to get into that part? Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump into that. And I have to say that this is not a lot of what a lot of the tips that I'm about to, you know, talk about for um, combating your nerves and making being nervous part of your practice. Um, it's not original material. They're tips I've picked up from other people along the way. Um, a lot of musician friends have shared with me their tips for, um, you know, practicing being nervous as preparation for their jury. Um, I've gotten a lot of them from my teachers along the way. And also I've referenced this guy several times on the podcast, Noah Kayaga. Uh, bulletproofmusician.com. He is like literally a genius. If you have any questions about nerves while practicing or like the psychological side of music making, he has it on his website. He's amazing. So um, the first tip that I have is playing for other people. You're like, wow, revolutionary. Never would have thought of it. But how many of us actually do it in the weeks leading up to our juries? You know, like our professors are like, play for each other. And you're like, oh, that's so nice. What a good suggestion. And then we never do it. We never play for each other. And that's like kind of scary like going up to another clarinet player and being like, hey, will you listen to me do this? Like you're putting yourself in a really vulnerable position there. Um, you know, I've known people to even go up to the person in the practice room next to them. Like if I was to go over to this tuba player over here that you can probably hear and be like, hey, can you listen to me play this real quick? Like that's terrifying to me. And that's probably kind of scary to a lot of us listening as well. Um, but I would just say that like, if you're the person that starts doing that, other people are going to start doing it too. Like when you make a culture of like, oh, we help each other, like we listen to each other and it's not for the sake of like being judgy, it's just to be like a warm body in the room. Like if that person has suggestions for you, then great, you can choose to take them or not take them. But the point is just to get somebody else in the room because we all act different when we're around another person. So do it play for other people. And I've even had friends where they FaceTime me and played and played for me, like played down their audition packet or something. And that's not quite the same as having somebody like physically in the room with you listening to you play. But I mean, it's kind of the same principle, like when we're recording ourselves for pre-screenings or something, you know, the second you hit record, you're like, suddenly this little awareness raises inside of you, like, oh, 
I'm being watched. And so you can kind of get that when you're FaceTiming somebody as well. Um, yeah. So play for other people. I'm guilty, guys. I haven't done it yet, but I need to. So I, I plan on it. <laughs> um, the second thing I have on this list is doing some kind of physical activity to help simulate the fight or flight response um, while you play. And so you're like, that's kind of weird. Like, why would I just like do some jumping jacks or some crunches in my practice room and then try and play my instrument like that doesn't seem like you know good advice because then you're out of breath then you're a little bit shaky and my answer to you would be well isn't that what happens when we're nervous you know when we're nervous our adrenaline starts rushing through our body our, our body literally thinks we're in danger whenever we get nervous they're like oh there's a bear let's fight it that's what our body says and so you get shaky you your heart starts pumping faster and so a really great way to practice playing under those kind of bodily conditions is by doing some kind of physical activity Alex and I had a snare had a had a percussionist friend in undergrad and I I knew him to like run around our music building which was like basically shaped like a donut he would do laps around the music building and then see how quietly he could play his snare drum excerpts but like because like his hands would be shaking after sprinting around the building so many times and so he knew that if he could play his excerpts cleanly while his hands were shaking and his heart was racing and he was breathing heavy from running around the building then he could do it when he was a little bit nervous and that was something that I actually started to do too the past like my last two years at undergrad I would reserve the recital hall for like a few nights the week of my recital and I would run laps around the recital hall jump up on stage play a movement of pooling run around some more jump up on stage do the really quiet second movement run around some more and honestly guys it helped because whenever I walked out on stage for my recital, I wasn't out of breath. I had all the oxygen in the world compared to running around. And so just like practicing under conditions that make your body so much more stressed out and proving to yourself that you can do it when your body is not at its best, um, that's really comforting. And it kind of like gives you courage on the day of your jury. Do you have reactions to this, Alex? No, I think you're making all valid points. I think one big like encompass encompassing thought is that what Hannah's saying is what I totally agree with, but it's under the category of stimulating the feeling of that environment, jury or recital. Like that is so important because a lot of the times, like you practice by yourself and you go and play in front of five to 20 people because even five people are scary to be honest and really have to mentally and physically prepare for that. I don't personally do laps. I don't find that oxygen is an issue for me. I think for me, it's all mental. So I do a lot of mental practice. So one thing that has helped me that no one ever actually taught me, but I've done for quite a while just by myself and I've shared with people, but I legitimately would be like in my bedroom right now, standing by my music stand, close my eyes and envision the room that I'm going to perform in. That's the first step. Then I envision who I know will be in the audience. Then once I get that visual, I go and I'm horrified. But when I keep doing that over and over and over for weeks and weeks and weeks, when the day comes and those people are in that space, the ones that you may be wanting to prove, for example, in a jury, like prove your worth to in a jury or a recital, when it comes to that day, I've already seen you there. I've already been here. Now I'm okay. So that's what I do. I do a lot of mental practice because for me, it's so funny, but the way my nerves work, and I tell my mom this all the time, and she's like so confused, but like, I'm not nervous when I first start playing. I play and then I'm in my head while I'm playing, which I shouldn't be. I'm like, why aren't I nervous? And then I'm like, oh, you should be nervous. And then I get nervous. <laughs> it's so weird. But like, it's in the middle of my performance when the nerves really hit. It's like, oh shoot, you're like really doing the thing. Here we go. So for me, that's why I like have to like, mentally freak myself out just a little bit although that sounds so bad like saying out loud but I know that's what occurs when I'm performing in a jury or in a recital so no I think that's so important what you said is like a lot of people myself included start out performances really strong or you know stronger than we would be otherwise but then like like the danger starts when you start like metacognitively like thinking about performing you're like oh I'm performing I'm in front of people and then sometimes I get these intrusive intrusive thoughts where I'm like dang this is going really well it would be a shame if something were to happen and then I'm like no no what's gonna happen so 
I mean, maybe, maybe you practice, like maybe while you practice, you try and swing these thoughts away. Like, I don't know. They're not helpful to you. That's the bottom line is like, these thoughts are not going to help you perform at your best. And so, I mean, as much as you can in your practice to just like, shut that down, like imagine like pulling a blind down over window, just like shut that down and focus on the music. Um, but that's easier said than done. And it takes practice and it takes like intentional. I'm not going to think this thing or shutting it down the second it enters your brain but if that's you if you have intrusive thoughts or if you start thinking about playing just know that you're not alone it happens to everybody sometimes I'm like dang does anybody else do this does anybody else self-sabotage this hard and I'm like yeah girl so because I'm like I'm in a whole performance right now like why am I thinking about this like why am I thinking about the errors that I'm, and it's really like a thought that it's like wow this is going really good like don't mess up don't messes up I'm like Literally. Like as soon as you start tagging that thought on, because for me, I know the thought is going to come. So for me, it's training to stop it right away or stop it as soon as possible, like Hannah said. So yeah, it's just knowing what happens to you in a performance because some people physically shake, right? Like you mentioned running laps so that you're physically shaking. Some people unfortunately have like a physical reaction to performance anxiety, right? And stress. So you have to figure out how do I play when my hands are like quivering, right? Like when they're shaking, what do I do? Because you need these to be stable, especially in a slow movement. So it's like figuring out what happens to you when you're nervous. And okay, now that you know those things, how can we help to not, you can't even fix it in my opinion, but like deal with it, like perform with those factors occurring. So yeah, it's real. It is real. Absolutely. So those are some things we talked a little bit about, like the physical side, how you can like put yourself out there to help deal with the physical side. Some things are the physical side of performance anxiety, some things that you can do to kind of, um, I guess you could combat both things at once um, is play in a semi-public place. I mean, I can't really do this at UNT, but at our undergrad, Messiah, we had these big stairwells and it was really popular to practice in the stairwells. The trumpet players would always go in the stairwells because they sound so good in there. But the thing is about the stairwells is like people could hear you in the stairwells no matter what you played. And so maybe that's a good solution for you. Maybe that's the first step to get getting to getting yourself out there for playing in public. Um, maybe it's like cracking open your practice room door a little bit so that people can hear you as they pass. Um, maybe that's the first step you can take. Another thing is obviously you can play in your studio class or your departmental. Again, that's really scary as well to get up in front of a room full of clarinet players who you know, they probably know your piece. They know all of the little weird clarinet things that could happen to you, you know, in your performance. But if you can play in front of a room of clarinet players, then I I actually get less intimidated being like, well, I'm going to play for the bassoon. Prof I mean, our, our bassoon professor is great, but like, I'm going to play for the bassoon professor. Like he, he's not going to tell me that I need to voice higher on this note because it's in this register and it has this tendency on my heart. Like, he's not going to say that. He's just going to be like, wow, that was a really nice phrase, you know, stuff like that. Anyways, and then the final thing I have is just to record yourself. And I would say record yourself consistently um, in the few weeks leading up to your jury. Um, just, I would say record yourself every day. I've become a really big fan of that. And just like listening back because it's so hard to analyze in the moment, like while you're doing, and we've kind of talked about that on here before, like while you are in the act of actually playing, it is really hard for, to like step outside of your body and be like, how is this really going? And it's also not, you're not able to get the most true representation of your sound either, because you're on this end of the horn, probably in a room that's this big, right? And so you're not getting a sense of what your truest sound is. You know, you're not getting the best read on what your dynamic levels are. If you're really making that shape in the that phrase so I would say record yourself um even if it's not every day but record yourself at least a couple times before your jury so that you can check up on those things um some other tips for like preparation this is kind of like this could this isn't like directly going to you know train your body like a physical thing to respond to nerves and it's not even necessarily mental practice but it's just some things to do in these final steps in case you're like still feeling like wow I'm still really worried and I'm not sure why maybe these things could help you out as well um, the first thing is do you know the score well and um, the answer is usually not well enough especially if you have a really great pianist a really great collaborator playing with you um, chances are you trust them to like 
know their part and to come in but I've been in jury situations where I've had a really great pianist and they've like done something weird or missed something that I was just used to hearing and it like really jarred me and it really threw me off so I would say um you could do some mental practice by sitting down with a recording of your piece and getting a score or a piano score and seeing how the pianist's part lines up with you you might learn some things about your own part even in doing that where you should be louder how you should shape things differently um and everything like that even if your collaboration is going well, it's still just good to have that awareness. Um, another thing is li listening to others' interpretations and getting ideas for your own expression. So, I mean, my teachers say to me, like, in the final stages before your performance or before your jury that, like, you shouldn't be listening to other people because you should be working on your own interpretation. And I agree with that to a point with, like, a little asterisk, but I listen to people all the time. Like, I am constantly the best, I, I, I think the best, the most successful people steal things, right? So, like, they, they just, like, take things from other people like oh I really liked how he did this phrase but I really liked the way that she treated the taper in this moment and I think that that's fine and I think that you should do that and I think that's doing your due diligence as a musician I see you nodding and yes girling that Alex do you want to chime in I just agree because I noticed it a lot this semester like I knew this was a mindset people had like don't listen to recordings but I'm like the opposite especially when it comes to picking a piece I pick a piece because I like the recording of it like that is the reality of the situation so why wouldn't I reference that recording like for example Hannah mentioned I had a recital so I'm not doing a jury but same effect to a certain extent right I mean, I did my jury and the week leading up, I was listening to the recording while practicing type of situation. Cause I'm like, I've been doing it like this, but like, I just realized that he was doing that actually. And I kind of like that. So let's experiment with that a little bit. And there was a cadenza in my piece. I was like, let me listen to theirs. Mm, I don't really like that. And I was doing that. So let me change it. Right. So it's like leading up to the day. Like, I think it's always good to listen to the recording because for one, it gives you awareness of the piece. But for me, I think it also reinforces your knowledge of the piece. I think mm -hmm. like, yes, some people score a study and I can honestly say I'm not usually the person that like physically looks at a score to learn the piano's part. Mm -hmm. I'm just really good at learning it by air. Like, well, I was learning the Harburg Sonata for the longest time this semester. And that piece is hard. The piano part is hard and complex. And I mean, my friend and I, we would just joke because we knew each other's parts so well that regardless of whatever mistakes happened, I could find him and he could find me. And that's for me just listening to the piece and performing it and practicing it all the time, but also practicing with him, knowing, okay, here's where he might slip up. Here's where I'm typically like confused. So let's figure out a way to meet in the middle. Such, but that's what you need. You need to collaborate with your pianist to understand those weaknesses and strengths for each other so that when you're in a performance, regardless of what happens, you'll survive. So yeah, I like two things that you said. Um, the first thing is just a response to how you listen to the recordings and um, the way that you use recordings, I think is amazing. And I think that's the way everybody should use recordings is that you're like analyzing the recordings. Like, I like this, I'm going to do this. I don't like this. I'm not going to do that. Some people, and it's, I feel that it's especially easy to do with like contemporary pieces where interpretations can be very can can be very varied there, there can be a lot of ways to play something um for example Jean on's blush i just learned that this past semester and so i think it's problematic if somebody says i'm gonna play this exactly like wong tak kim i'm gonna do everything he does just because i'm too scared to create my own point of view or i don't know what i should do I think that's like a not good way to use recordings because I think you should have a point of view. But if you want to get, like, if you want other options, if you want to experiment with other ideas, like you were saying, Alex, I think that's a great way to use recordings. And I'm totally in that boat with you. So um, as long as you are not just like letting somebody else make the artistic decisions for you, definitely use recordings. Um, the other thing that you said is that you you really viewed Connor, your awesome, amazing pianist, you viewed each other as collaborative partners. And I feel like it's easy for especially young musicians to view the pianist that they're playing with as an accompanist. And I have a I have a roommate who's a piano player and she does not like the word accompanist. And a lot of people here at UNT don't like the word accompanist because it insinuates that 
they play a lesser role in the performance or in the act of music making, which if you've ever worked with a pianist, you know that that's not the truth. You're like, dang, look at them go. They got 10 fingers and 50 notes that they have to read. And I just got one little do 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 line, right? And so I feel that it's important that you enter collaborations with your pianist as an equal partner. So like, so often we show up and expect our pianists to have like everything to a T. Well, do you have everything to a T? Are you prepared enough that you're ready to be an equal partner in that collaboration? Because I've caught my pianist before. It's happened to me and Alex has caught her pianist before. It's not just like a one way street. So make sure that um, number one, you're using recordings for good and not for evil. And number two, that you're entering your collaboration with your pianist as an equal partner. And you're not just like riding on their musical amazingness. So some people, and I feel like this is very applicable for recitals, if you still have a recital coming up, um, a lot of people worry a lot about stamina. And so Alex, do you have any advice to give about practicing and building stamina for a particularly taxing or long performance? Okay, hear me out. Okay, so I know Hannah does one thing, and I, I'm going to briefly mention it because I used to do it. Hannah is a fitness girly. Like Hannah is pretty fit. Like most of the times, especially in undergrad, you did a lot of running or like at least treadmill walking. Like you always had cardio, right? And in undergrad, I was pretty good at that. Like I maintained cardio. At ASU, the campus is so big that I just can't, I just count me walking from my car to school as my cardio. And it's Have you seen what Alex drags with her every single day? Like that's more than cardio. That's weight training right there. <laughs> so cardio helps. I could say that because if you could run, for 20 plus minutes, you could probably play for 20 plus minutes. Um, so that's one part. And I used to do that. But the main thing that I do is running my whole program. I practice, especially the month of my recital was a bit like April 16th or something like that. No, 20, no, March. Whoa, March 26th. Time warp. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to figure out the date because I had set a goal for myself that by March 1st, I was going to know all of my material. So that starting on March 1st, up until my recital, every day I would run my entire program. That's for me how I built my stamina. I know something that you do, because you've told me before, you run your reps sometimes like twice a day. I don't typically do that at all. I just run my program once and I assess it because the one time is all I get for a performance. With that though, I also try to do it as close to the time of the performance as possible. So my recital is at 2.30. I try to practice as close to 2.30 to start programming my brain to function at that hour because I know when my brain is optimal and it is not at 2.30. Um, that's very important, even if you're doing a jury, especially if you have a morning jury and you're not a morning practicer, you know? So that's a big part of performance. It's like simulating what's going to happen the day of. If you have a 9 a.m. jury and your piece is 20 minutes long, can you play a 20 minute piece at 9 a.m., right? So those are some things I have in terms of stamina and everything else. <laughs> No, I think that's really wise. And honestly, I never thought of that, like practicing when your performance was going to be because I'm an afternoon snoozer too. Y'all see me right now sipping because I got a lot of evening rehearsals and stuff after that. Like I'm sleepy in the afternoons, but not like a 4 p.m. jury. So I'm going to have to be on it. So thanks, Alex. I'm definitely going to do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would just say um, if you're worried about stamina for your piece, like if that's a serious concern of yours is like getting through the piece for whatever reason, um, I would encourage you to practice your piece um, right after a rehearsal or after you are at the end of your practice block to see what happens whenever you're tired. Because we all know that in a performance, we all fatigue a little bit more quickly because, you know, we're adrenaline is running high our our energy is going to other places and we're using it faster than we would be if we were just like living life normally and not in such a high pressure pressure situation um so just be aware that you know you will crash a little bit faster in a performance um you know there's something about nerves that like kind of like carry you through but just be aware that like you will tire out a little more quickly and um prepare for that so yeah i would suggest like warming or playing your piece without warming up that like eh, take that with a grain of salt like it can be helpful, but don't make a habit of it because you should all warm up. But it's really helpful to be like, oh, how does it sound whenever I haven't done my articulation studies for the day? Like whenever I haven't warmed my tongue up to 160, what happens now? Um, and if you can do it, then that should be really comforting to you. Like, oh, hey, I, I can do this. Like I, I'm prepared for this. 
Um, but yeah, multiple times a day. I really like the idea about practicing about the time that you would do your performance or your jury. That's all um, That's all we have to offer Thank you on stamina. Yeah. Thanks, Els. Oh, dang it. Poor old brain. I already forgot my point. Oh, we were talking about like, twice a day after rehearsal without warming up it should make you confident warm up thank you hannah oh work partnership okay here we go so here we go so something that my professors are big on is that the day you have a jury anything even if you're playing in studio do not do your full warm-up i mean warm-ups vary per person but especially for my asu studio mates who probably watch this or may watch this or future issues well, should be watching this people. but if you've ever had the dr gardner slash dr spring warm-up pack if you've ever done the full thing like and the full thing is long tones major minors all of them thirds arpeggios and articulation that doesn't include like the diminished etc that alone is exhausting so the day of you should never do your full warm-up you should do an abbreviated version when you do the abbreviated version, that creates a different feel because you're not as warmed up as you usually are, right? So that's a big factor when you are like having a jury or a performance um, to ensure that you're practicing. I also agree. Practice with no warm up some days. Practice with the abbreviated warm up to get that feel. Practice with the full warm up to get that feel and alternate between those. In my opinion, I've done that and I highly recommend. I actually really try to train myself to do cold performances only because I know for some reason, because I do an abbreviated warm up, my hands get so cold, meaning they're tight, meaning they don't want to move. So I really try to do less warm up performances situation and just performance go. And it trains my fingers to like move even when I don't want that or when they don't want to move. But like Hannah said, I don't encourage that all the time. One, because you should do your warm up, but also two, that could cause injuries if you're doing very technical things on hard muscles, basically, like that aren't warm up. So yeah, that's all I wanted to add. No, for sure. Don't mess around with like the with the injury. You do not. You don't have time for that, people. You don't want that. Don't do it. Don't do it, girl. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like Alex and I are throwing a lot of things out, like things that we have learned, things that have helped us in the past. And if you're listening and you're like, wow, like I, I really struggle with my nerves. And so I should be doing this. I would encourage you to like, not try everything. So like, maybe like pick one thing that's going to help you respond better physically to, to being nervous. Maybe pick one thing that is going to help you mentally respond better to being nervous. And maybe pick one thing in your preparation that you are going to do a little bit differently or that you're going to do a little bit more thoroughly um but definitely don't try and do all of these things at once because completely like reshifting your entire process or where you are in your timeline for your jury that's not going to be helpful to you at all so I mean we're just kind of like putting out a buffet of things a buffet of nerve medicine I guess but um <laughs> here you go you're welcome but yeah just pick a few things and give it a shot and then you're like okay well if I do that like how will I know if it's working or if it works well um you can tell if it's working if you like record yourself and the days leading up to your jury and it's better than it was and so I think it's important to do that like hey is what I am trying is this new thing I'm doing actually helpful to me? And if it is, that's great. Keep doing it. Make, make it part of like the things that you do when you're getting ready for a performance. But if it's not helping you or if you don't notice a change, it's okay to go back to the drawing board and like try something else. Like there's no shame in like shifting your approach. Um, and obviously if you have a good jury, then you know that something, <laughs> that something went right too. But I think that, I think that the biggest thing that kind of helps me with my nerves, especially at this time of the year, like we should like take a step back and say that, you know, juries are a big thing, but part of what makes juries so stressful is all the other stuff going on at the same time as juries. It's the final papers. It's the final exams. It's the final, the final concerts of your ensembles that are probably really demanding. It's, you know, that thing that you have to play in your methods class to, pl to prove that you can play the oboe, even though you're a clarinet player. Like, it's just, it's stuff like that. So, and it's like all of these things adding up and then your jury is like the capstone, like, Oh my gosh, like everybody just has so much going on at this point. But even in these times where everything can feel so overwhelming at the end of the year, I kind of just like to like do a values assessment. Like, 
why am I doing this? Like, and hopefully that's a good answer for you. I'm doing this because I love music. Um, earlier, I guess it was, was it last month? Yeah, because it was due April 1st. I was doing some recordings and um, my teacher asked me about it because she knew I was doing some recordings after our studio class. She was like, are you ready to record tonight? I was like, I had like a really bad day and a super bad rehearsal that afternoon. I was like, yeah, fine, I guess. I'm just ready to get it done. And she was like, hey, music is fun, remember? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> because honestly, like there, I would say, and I want to know your opinion on this too, Alex. I would say more days than not, I feel like music is hard. It's hard work, but I think it's important for us to remember that like, we wouldn't have gotten into this if we didn't get joy out of it, if we didn't think it was fun. And that kind of helps me get perspective. I have something to add to that because I just watch the weirdest Instagram reel ever. And what you just said kind of like triggered that reminder. It's always good to like remind yourself like why you're doing this, like what goal you have. But I don't believe in gaslighting myself, like telling myself that like, yeah, yeah. I'm in love with this right now. When in reality, like you have days where you have to acknowledge how you really feel. And I think that's okay. That's healthy to not convince yourself that everything's okay when everything's not okay. So I think, yes, music is fun and I do have goals, but sometimes you do have bad days. And when you push through it, you are really proud of yourself for doing that. But don't diminish your real feelings in the moment. Because like you mentioned, with everything you said previously, it is very stressful around juries. Like it is hard because you have so much to balance. And the mindset that I have, especially around juries is that I don't really put my full attention to juries, nor do I put my full attention to the other papers or exams that I have. I try to do it as equal as possible, meaning not as much time as put towards one thing type of situation. Like I try to spread it out equally, basically. So I'm trying to say, but that's why it's so hard. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that. And it's just okay to remind yourself like why you're doing this. Like you have a goal, like, do you still feel that way? Just have a moment with yourself. So yeah. yeah. Feel your feelings. Feel the feels. <laughs> um, And I would say too, in just like mentally preparing for juries, like kind of in this way, just in like taking stock of, you know, your musical goals and um, why you're doing this, uh, just a PSA that your worth as a human does not come from your jury score. Um, I feel like so often in music, we take things really personally and we put a lot of stock, like we put a lot of our self-worth, like how we feel about ourselves into how well we perform. And that can be great when we perform well, like, yeah, I did that. I feel great about myself and you should feel great about yourself if you performed well, but if you perform badly, like you, you can't be like, well, I must be a terrible person and I must not, I should not be a musician because that's just like, that's not true. So don't hang all of your self-worth on your jury or on any given performance, because that's just not healthy. And I would say too, I heard this from Ray Chen violin, which he's a great Instagram follow. If you're not following him, everybody should follow Ray Chen. He's so funny, but he said that one of the best pieces of advice he got for performance anxiety was from his dad who said, just accept that something's going to go wrong. Like, just know that you will mess up something. It could be a huge screw up. It could be a little screw up, but like, you're going to mess up because you're a human. And it's not the fact that you mess up. It's how you respond to the messing up. So do you let that mistake that you made back in measure two keep tripping you up for the whole rest of the piece? Or do you just make the mistake and move on and keep doing all of the things that you've trained your body and your mind to do throughout the rest of the piece? And something, Dr. Spring told me the same thing, actually, my first master's recital, which was funny because I played to a hall of three people because Rona. Um, but anyways, he told me the same thing. He was like, you're playing a recital for an hour, like a mistake is going to happen. And the reason why he said it wasn't necessarily the reason why Ray might have or what Ray may have interpreted. But for Dr. Spring, it was a matter of when you know you're going to make a mistake, you don't go in there thinking you're going to be perfect, which is good because then a lot of us have the expectation that, oh my God, I hope I play everything as good as I've been practicing. Like when I play a bat, none of that's going to happen. This is going to be A++++. Plus, plus, plus. But it's not true. Like something's going to happen. And when you realize that you're a little bit more content and he joked saying, and I mentioned this before, but he joked saying someone 
I think his old professor is the one who told him that. And what his professor used to do was try to make a mistake in the first movement of the first piece he played, meaning the mistake was out of the way. And now he can relax because everything feels so fine after you recover from a mistake, in my opinion. Like the mistake happened. Okay, cool. Now, what can I do now? Keep going. Have fun now, whatever. And I mean, that may not be the same for everyone, but it helped me at least. Yeah, that's really good advice. Well, then pod audience, just know that this is a tough time of year for everybody, but Alex and I are cheering for you. We know you can do it. We know you can make it through this final stretch and best of luck to you on your jury. We hope you play great. This has been the Ben pod. <laughs> Thank you.